Question. Why do people hang stockings for Santa on Christmas? It's hard to picture Christmas morning without stockings hanging somewhere. But if you actually think about it for one second, it's a pretty weird tradition. Asking Santa Claus to fill a big stinky sock with toys and treats is definitely strange. And even stranger, no one really knows how it started. There is one popular story that's probably a bit more fiction than fact, but it gives the Christmas stocking quite the fantastical origin. According to the tale, there was a father with three daughters who was having trouble making ends meet. He worked hard day in and day out, but as winter approached, he worried he just couldn't do enough for them. Come Christmas time, good old St. Nicholas happened to be in town, heard all about the family, and decided to secretly help. At night, he visited the house and found socks hanging by the fireplace to dry. Being the generous gift giver that he is, St. Nick dug deep into his pockets and pulled out some coins, filling the socks. But that's just one version of the story. And like we said, as nice as it is, it's probably not true. But however this strange stocking tradition got started, it clearly caught on. Kids were hanging a big sock by the fireplace all across Europe, hoping for a gift from St. Nicholas. The tradition did morph and change over time in different areas. Some places leave out shoes instead of stockings on St. Nicholas Day. December 6th, instead of Christmas Eve, the shoes are left out with a bit of hay for St. Nick's donkey, and by morning, they're filled with treats and toys. Whether it's hay in your shoes or milk and cookies with the stocking, it all seems to be a variation on the same tradition. By the early 1800s, the custom of hanging a stocking for Christmas had made it to the United States, and people were already ditching their old dirty socks in favor of fancy stockings designed specifically for the season. By the turn of the century, the plump, oversized stockings covered in Christmas designs that we know and love today was firmly in style. Not only do big, specialized holiday stockings have way more space for stuffing, but they look much nicer hanging by the chimney with care. So this year, remember, it might seem weird to hang stockings, but at least we've come a long way from getting gifts in our dirty laundry. What makes eggnog a holiday drink? No one knows for sure exactly when eggnog was first invented, but most food historians believe it descended from a medieval English milky drink called posset. Posset was a hot, thick, spicy drink that had a lot of the same basic ingredients as modern day eggnog. Over time, the drink got more and more popular with monks and other high society folks who started adding fancier and more expensive ingredients like figs, milk, and yeah, eggs. The milky spiced egg drink made its way across the Atlantic from England to the American colonies in the 1700s and first began its seasonal association with the holidays. You see, the American colonies were chock full of farms filled with chickens and cows, which meant Americans had plenty of milk and eggs to make the drink. Over in America, it never really became a fancy drink, but took on a new life as a popular Christmas time treat. It's warm for cold weather days and full of seasonal spices like cinnamon, nutmeg, and vanilla. Ever since, eggnog has almost exclusively been associated with the holiday season in the US and Canada. And in most places, you can only find it in stores around Christmas. Just like its origin, no one knows for sure where eggnog got its name, but experts do have a few educated guesses. Some think nog comes from the word noggin, which was a carved wooden cup that some might use for, say, a nice warm glass of egg drink, hence, eggnog. So, love it or hate it, clearly eggnog is here to stay and will be part of the holiday season for a long time. Because once something becomes a Christmas tradition, it tends to stick around, no matter how strange. Did the pilgrims and Native Americans really have a first Thanksgiving meal together as friends? When the pilgrims first arrived at Plymouth Rock in March of 1621, they decided to call this new land home. Thing is, 
it was already home for thousands of Native Americans. Since neither side wanted a fight, the Pilgrims signed a peace treaty with the native Wampanoag tribe shortly after settling in Plymouth. They didn't sit down for the holiday feast we now call Thanksgiving until a full year after arriving. This event has gone down in American history as the first Thanksgiving, but it turns out that at the time, the meal wasn't that big of a deal. Harvest celebrations were fairly common in English culture as a way to celebrate in a new season and the new food that comes with it. Oh, and they also might not have eaten the classic Thanksgiving meal. That's right! While the first Thanksgiving may have had turkey on the menu, it's just as likely that they served duck, goose, or swan as the main course. So what gives? Why do we all know this myth of the first Thanksgiving, and where did it come from? When did Thanksgiving become the Thanksgiving we know today? Well, it took some time. From the 1620s to the mid-1800s, a festival of Thanksgiving would occasionally be celebrated in different parts of the country, but it was by no means an official holiday. President Abraham Lincoln made Thanksgiving an official national holiday in the United States in 1863. These early Thanksgiving holidays were celebrated much the same we do today. Big feasts with the family eating turkey and other delicious fall foods. So, once and for all, was there a first Thanksgiving? Yes, there was. It just wasn't as important at the time as we make it out to be now. The myth slowly morphed over time, and families told and retold the story of the pilgrims and the first Thanksgiving meal way back in 1621. Okay, that's enough. Now, go eat some pumpkin pie. When and why did turkeys become the main course on Thanksgiving? There is historical evidence of a feast shared between the pilgrims and the Wampanoag people in 1621, an event which has come to be known as the first Thanksgiving. But it wasn't the kind of Thanksgiving feast we might imagine today. There was no mashed potatoes, stuffing, or sweet pies for dessert. And maybe most shocking of all, there might not have been any turkey either. Turkeys were native to the area and a common source of food at the time, but we know the Wampanoag brought deer and the pilgrims brought wild fowl, which could have been turkey, but may have been duck, goose, or swan. And the poultry options weren't the only thing different about the first Thanksgiving menu. Seafood was a plenty and probably on the menu. Mussels, oysters, lobsters, bass, and clams were all over the New England shores. As were fruits and vegetables like onions, peas, cabbage, blueberries, gooseberries, raspberries, grapes, plums, and raw cranberries. Not exactly the massive feast we think of today. In fact, the pilgrims hadn't even built themselves an oven for baking, so there were no baked goods of any kind. And not only was the menu quite different, but the event itself wasn't as big of a deal at the time as we make it out to be today. For the pilgrims, large autumn harvest feasts were nothing new. Europeans had been holding harvest festivals since the ancient times. So holding a special day of Thanksgiving was pretty common for the New England colonists. So when did Thanksgiving go from a run-of-the-mill celebration to a major modern American holiday known mostly for a big turkey feast? Well, no one can say exactly when the turkey officially became the main course on the Thanksgiving menu, but many point to a writer and activist named Sarah Josepha Hale. She's considered by many to be the person most responsible for making Thanksgiving a national holiday in the U.S. and for making the turkey a mainstay of the menu. Why turkey as opposed to other wild fowl? Well, by the early 1800s, turkey had become a staple food to serve for feasts. They were super common, super easy to hunt, and big enough to feed a full family. In 1846, Hale began to publicly push to make Thanksgiving an official national holiday. It would take her 17 years of lobbying five different presidents before Abraham Lincoln was finally convinced. He supported her push and was able to establish Thanksgiving as an American national holiday in 1863. This was a pretty big deal. At the time, there were only two national holidays in the U.S. 
Washington's birthday, and Independence Day. As Thanksgiving became an organized holiday, a mythology started to form around it. Suddenly, the Pilgrim's Feast with the Wapanog was known as the first Thanksgiving and treated like a monumental event. Over time, the connection between Pilgrims, Turkeys, and Thanksgiving became so intertwined that it's hard to imagine one without the other. So, this Thanksgiving, enjoy a plate full of whatever Thanksgiving foods you like the best. And be glad our bounty is a bit more impressive than the first time around. Who invented Valentine's Day? And when did it start? As you probably know, Valentine's Day, also known as St. Valentine's Day, is a holiday held every year on February 14th to celebrate our loved ones, give them cards, candy, and other gifts to show them how we feel. Who is St. Valentine? And why was this lovely holiday named after him? It's hard to say. For starters, there are several different saints named Valentine. Experts can't say for sure which one is the man behind the holiday, but some believe it's named after St. Valentine of Rome, who died in 269 AD after defying the emperor. Claudius II decided that single men made better soldiers than guys with wives and families, so he outlawed marriage for young men of fighting age. St. Valentine defied the emperor's orders and continued performing marriage ceremonies for young, love-struck couples in secret until he was discovered and put to death. Okay, so the history of how the holiday got its name is murky to say the least, but what about its date? Why does Valentine's Day fall on February 14th? Most experts believe it was picked to keep the tradition of an old Roman festival called Lupercalia. It was a day-long holiday dedicated to love and fertility held on the 15th of February each year. As Christianity spread across the Roman Empire, Lupercalia was outlawed and replaced with a church-approved version held the day before known as St. Valentine's Day that took its place. By the Middle Ages, lovers began giving valentines to each other. The oldest known valentine was written in 1415 by Charles, Duke of Orleans, to his wife while he was locked up in the Tower of London after being captured in battle. A woman named Esther Howland, known today as the mother of the American Valentine, invented the first mass-produced version, which was decorated with lace, colored paper, ribbons, and other things we're still using to make them. Today, almost 150 million Valentine's Day cards are sent every year, and that number is only growing. So this year, if you've got a special someone on your mind, do what people have done for thousands of years. Work up the nerve to write them a Valentine. Why is February Black History Month? It hasn't gone unnoticed on the internet that Black History Month also just so happens to fall on the shortest month of the year. Coincidence? I think not. But luckily, not for a bad reason. February became Black History Month, not because it's shorter than any other month, but because a couple of important figures happen to have February birthdays. You see, the idea goes all the way back to the mid-1920s, when a historian named Carter G. Woodson worked with an organization to create what they called Negro History Week. Mr. Woodson didn't like that most school textbooks at the time either minimized or all-out ignored much of black history in the U.S. and the contributions of all kinds of black historical figures. So he decided to take matters into his own hands and help raise awareness. He worked with a nonprofit group to organize the event, landing on the second week of February, hoping it would help raise awareness for all these lost stories. Why the second week of February specifically? Well, Woodson picked that week because of two big birthdays, Abraham Lincoln on the 12th and Frederick Douglass on the 14th. Lincoln gave the Emancipation Proclamation, which declared that all enslaved people were free. And Frederick Douglass was a former slave and an abolitionist who was a powerful speaker and writer on African-American issues before, during, and after the Civil War. Both men were iconic figures, and both had birthdays the same week. So to Carter G. Woodson, it seemed like a no-brainer. At first, declaring a specific week to learn the history of black Americans was 
more or less ignored in some parts of the country, while others took to it right away. It took some time, but over the years, mayors, school districts, and colleges around the country started to recognize it more and more. Over time, the groundswell of interest helped the holiday grow to the point where students at Kent State University in 1969 proposed the idea of a Black History Month. They built off the back of the week-long occasion and decided to make the entire month of February a chance to learn about Black history. The event took place on the school's campus in February of 1970. The idea spread and fast. Just six years later, President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month as part of the Bicentennial, a series of celebrations for America's 200th birthday. So why is February Black History Month? Well, definitely not because it's the shortest month of the year, but to recognize two iconic figures in US history who happened to be born in February. So 28 days might make the shortest month, but it's plenty of time to learn, just like Carter G. Woodson always wanted. What exactly is a quinceanera? In places like Mexico, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the United States, Hispanic 15-year-old girls go through a special coming-of-age party on their 15th birthday called a quinceanera. The word itself is a mashup of two Spanish words, quince, which means 15, and año, which means year. Put them together and you have quinceanera, 15-year-old. The birthday girl herself is also <laughs> referred to as the quinceanera, so it can refer to the party or the guest of honor. Unlike your average birthday party, the special celebration marks a ceremonial transition from childhood into young adulthood. Like most traditions, there are lots of little differences in the way people celebrate this symbolic day. One of them is the changing of the shoes, where a loved one replaces the quinceanera's flat shoes with heels. Usually, the birthday girl will wear a fancy dress and style her hair to look a bit like a princess on her magic day. Traditionally, the dress is white or pink, but these days, most girls pick a color they like. The quinceanera also usually wears a tiara to top off the princess look. Often at a traditional quinceanera, there are special female friends and family members called damas, and their male counterparts called chamberlains. They're a bit like bridesmaids and groomsmen at a wedding. They're usually part of the different traditions and help celebrate the quinceanera with the rest of the guests. Sometimes, the father or another loved one presents the young woman to the party guests, and the partygoers get to mingling and dancing. Nowadays, more and more families and 15-year-old girls decide to do their own version of a quinceanera. Not all modern quinceaneras have damas or chamberlains, special shoe ceremonies, or even fancy dresses. So while the traditions might vary depending on where you're from, the core idea of the quinceanera is still the same. A once in a lifetime chance to be the fairy tale princess for a day before adulthood starts to finally set in. Why do we blow out candles on our birthday? Just like most other traditions, putting candles on birthday cakes is a ritual that dates back thousands of years at least. No one can say for sure who put candles on cakes for the first time? Tons of ancient civilizations believe that smoke carried their hopes and prayers up through the skies into the heavens, which might be the origin of our modern day birthday candles. After all, most of us make a wish when we blow them out. Around the time of ancient Greece, this ancient custom started to morph into a way to celebrate. People would put candles on cakes and light them as a tribute to Artemis, the Greek goddess of the hunt. The moon was a symbol of Aramis, so the cakes were cut into circles to represent the moon and the candles were lit to make the moon glow. Now the cake and candle tradition is starting to look more familiar. Other scholars believe that the modern day birthday cake and candle tradition may have actually started in Germany around the mid 1700s, 1746 to be exact. That year, a guy named Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf celebrated his 46th birthday in style. 
he had a lavish party, complete with a colossal cake covered in candles, one to represent each year, just like we do at birthday parties today. Von Zinzendorf didn't just come up with the idea out of thin air. Germans have been putting candles on cakes for generations, usually one large candle in the middle to symbolize the light of life. He was also playing off an old German festival of Kinderfest, a big party that was kind of like a birthday for all the kids in town. They would have cake topped with lots of candles, and the kids would get together, play games, sing songs, and, well, have a party. So, Count Ludwig was far from the first German to celebrate a birthday with the cake and candles, but he may have been one of the first to make it fashionable for the rich and famous. After all, cake was expensive and hard to make in those days, and not something the average person could just run out and buy on their birthday. But for the rich, it was becoming a yummy way to show off just how fancy they were. Eventually, the Industrial Revolution made it much easier for the average person to afford a cake. And we've been blowing out candles and stuffing our face with cake on our birthdays ever since. So, why do we blow out candles on our birthday? Because even as our world gets more and more digitized, we still have plenty of traditions that we've held for thousands and thousands of years. And that's a hard habit to kick. To this day, people all around the world still like to celebrate their birthdays with a party, cake, candles, maybe a song, and a wish. If they can manage to blow out all the candles in one breath, why is February only 28 days long? We have to go back to ancient Rome to answer this one. You see, the modern calendar we use in the Western world is based on the old, messy, inconsistent calendar the Romans used. Legend holds that Romulus, the very first king of Rome, implemented a 10-month calendar that began in March and ended in December. That's right, January and February didn't even exist yet. Since calendars were mainly used to help with the planting and harvesting of crops, winter became an unrecorded, nameless period of time. The next king of Rome decided it was time to fix the sloppy system started by Romulus. He better aligned the calendar with the lunar year, which is about 355 days long. He added the months January and February to the calendar after December to make up for all those new days, making February the last month of the year. But the king wasn't done tinkering with the calendar yet. You see, the always superstitious Romans believed that even numbers were unlucky. The king's solution? Try and make every month an odd number of days. The problem was, in order to have 355 days in a year, one month had to have an even number of days. Nobody's quite sure why February was the unfortunate month, but the most likely answer is also the simplest. February was the last month of the year. The second king of Rome finally had his calendar in place, and all was well and good. For a bit. Since it takes the Earth 365 days to orbit the Sun, and the calendar only had 355 days, after a few years, the seasons and the months would fall out of sync. By the time Julius Caesar arrived on the scene, Romans had no idea what day or month it was because the calendar was so screwy. So Caesar decided to get rid of the old calendar and make one of his own. He made the year 365 days long so that it lined up with the sun, shuffled a few months around, changed the names of a few months, and even named the month of July after himself. February, now in its rightful spot at the top of the calendar, still kept its 28 days. We don't know why Caesar kept February so short, but he'd probably have made it longer if he knew what was coming on the Ides of March. Thank <laughs> you.